and gone four o'clock. That's pretty good timing. Anyone that knows me knows that I'm not always the best, but thank you so much to everybody who's joined us uh, for this um, session, which is part of the wider text. Northeast Festival, um, which is going on over the next few days uh, across the Northeast region. So huge thank you to everyone who's joined us in person at the absolutely gorgeous open cast offices here in Biker. Um, it's a really sunny day, so I'm really glad that you've, uh, you've actually joined us inside. To all of you uh, digital leaders who have joined us online, thank you. I hope you're jo enjoying your G&Ts uh, in the garden while you're watching us. Um, so firstly, I just want to uh, do a little bit of housekeeping, which I've just been uh, uh, given. So uh, for those of you um, who are in person, in real life, uh, there's no fire alarms. So make sure that you um, exit at the back of the room uh, or via reception the way that you came if needed. Um, toilets, uh, the most uh, swanky toilets I've seen in some of the uh, tech companies around here are just through your door uh, next to the, uh, the what's been turned into the bar area for those of you online, um, just through there. Um, for anyone online who uh, who needs some captions, then you can click the uh, the CC button. Uh, we're really encouraging everybody to ask questions. Uh, so please have a think. We'll have a, a opportunity at the end where you'll be able to ask our uh, esteemed panelists whatever question you want. Ideally on topic, but we'll we'll go wherever you want it to go. For those of you online, please make sure that you put put it in the chat um, and Ellen will be helping to read those out at the end. Um, so those of you in real life, uh, just like in the Everyman Theatre, please switch off your phone. Sadly, we won't be taking food and drink orders throughout the session, uh, but as you can see, it will be available at the end. Um, so I'm going to start by asking each of the panellists to introduce themselves. And if we finish with uh, Neil, because you're going to be our star performer. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Jen Hartley. I'm Director of Invest Newcastle and Head of Economic Development uh, for Newcastle City Council. And I'm the one that has been uh, volunteered as chair. So if we start off with Henry. I'm doing so brilliantly so Already, far, already, say. two minutes in. <laughs> So my name is Henry, I'm Chief Executive of the North of Tyne Combined Authority and of the North East Merrill Combined Authority, which comes into being in May next year. Hi, and I'm Kate, um, I'm the Chief People Officer here at Opencast, so where we're hosting this event from. Um, Opencast is a fast growing tech consultancy based across the UK. Um, and yeah, I guess it's my job within Opencast is to make sure our company can really support all of our people to thrive, but also that we think hard about how we engage outside of our own organisation in terms of things like outreach um, and working with um, you know, the public sector to really create a, a technology sector that we're all proud of. Thank you and Neil. Hi, and my name is uh, Neil Ross. I'm Associate Director for Policy at Tech UK. And if you don't know who Tech UK are, Tech UK is a uh, trade association, so a membership body that represents about a thousand tech companies that operate all across the UK. So from Scotland, England, Northern Ireland, Wales, everywhere uh, across the country. Fabulous. And it's a bit disconcerting that Henry actually has his car keys on the table. So if it doesn't go well, he's doing a runner <laughs> straight away. And obviously Kate and I got the memo about, you know, t-shirt skirts uh, for the, for the uh, session today. So without further ado, I'm going to pass on to Neil. Um, as some of you will be aware, um, the uh, Tech UK released uh, their tech plan uh, last week. Is it last week? Yes. It's, oh, no, two stopped. weeks ago. So two, two weeks, weeks, weeks ago. Yeah. And we're really pleased that actually we're first on a list of roadshow appearances from Neil and the team to talk through uh, the plan. So Neil's going to give us a bit of an overview and then we'll open it up to the panel for a discussion. Thanks, Neil. I'm partly going to stand here and try and work the clicker, which let's see if we get the aha, there we go. Um, so why did we do something called a tech plan? Well, so Tech UK's role is not just to kind of convene people and bring people together, but also to try and represent the UK tech sector to the government, to political parties. And we felt that politicians probably don't pay enough attention to tech as they should do. Uh, and we wanted to make sure that when the next election comes around, that we put tech right up at the top of their radar when it comes to thinking about the policies that will shape the country going forward. And when it comes to that, it means you've really got to get in early. You know, if you publish something just before the next election, it's often it's a bit too late. The parties have kind of thought about it in more detail. 
So we decided to come up with our UK tech plan to start a conversation and to help tech businesses across the country start conversations with their politicians and their representatives to talk about what the tech sector can do and what it might mean if we invest in it for the future. So one of the things we really wanted to do was talk about some of the benefits that tech is, is playing right now in our uh, economy at the moment. So you can see here, we've got three examples of how the technology that we're using today is already helping uh, to improve our society and grow our economy whether it's using things like virtual wards to reduce the cost of caring for patients in the community by up to £2,000 per patient per year, growing the economy, you know, generative AI is showing to help boost productivity across a range of businesses in some cases, up to 14%. And the other thing is sort of reducing the cost of public services. Uh, systems like digital ID or even some of the work that OpenCast does is helping to cut the cost of how public services are being delivered, but also make them more customizable and more tailored for everyone. Um, and when we went out to do this project, we decided that we really wanted to listen to our members. So we did, um, it must have been about 20 or 30 kind of workshops with our members throughout the process, speaking to well over sort of 500 people from across our 1,000 members. And we wanted to drill into the detail of how they're feeling and what they want to see going forward. So the kind of main bit of feedback we got back is that the UK is a really great place to start and grow a tech company. The fundamentals of the economy are really strong and it is a good place to do business. However, there were some problems that everyone identified, and they included things like a lack of a kind of long-term plan for how tech is being deployed in the public services across the regions, et cetera. A lack of delivery on key strategies. You know, they felt like they would see a strategy like a wireless infrastructure strategy or a telecom strategy or an AI strategy come along, and before it could be implemented, it'd be replaced by another one and probably another prime minister, another secretary of state or someone else. That kind of lack of delivery wasn't there. Um, and they also felt that they, um, uh, sort of, yeah, lack of delivery, lack of long-term planning, and a kind of lack of follow-through of those things. We also kind of identify some of the big challenges that we need to overcome if we want the tech sector to really grow. And those were skills and adoption, so getting the right people into companies, but also encouraging other companies, you know, non-tech natives to start adopting technology. The scale-up challenge, you know, how we drive scale-up funding into businesses across the country from different set uh, setups. The investment challenge. So, how do you make sure the UK is a really competitive place to invest? So, you know, when you're trying to attract investment to your region or your place, you know that you're running with the best incentives to get the kind of best investment, and you're competing not just with your peers in the UK, but also across the world. Procurement. So, there's a big question about how the government is procuring technologies, uh, and then data. You know, how you get that access to data, or how data is shared across public services. And when we were building the manifesto, our members gave them lots of case studies and examples of. The stuff they're doing now, which is working really well, about how it could be sort of driven further. And we have this one here uh, from OpenCast, so looking at their work with the DWP, and also the kind of examples of how you could potentially drive that further and make it more effective going forward. So after kind of getting that sense from them of what they felt about the economy, what was going wrong and where we need to go forward, we put forward uh, 18 different opportunities that we thought could be seized if the next government can work in close collaboration with the tech sector. Now, I won't go through all 18, but they include things like, you know, making sure we can plug the digital skills gap to get more people into digitally skilled jobs uh, to kind of encourage adoption across the economy. And one of our members' pieces of research actually found that if we could level everyone's skills up to the kind of a kind of more digital native level, you could potentially give everyone a pay boost of about 5.69 billion pounds, which sounds quite nice in a cost of living crisis. Uh, other things we thought we could do is if you could just improve the way that people get access day to day public services. So if we can improve individuals confidence to use those kind of parking apps to access benefits to connect different things through online portals, you can make things more efficient for the individual, but also for the local authority who might want to spend money on other things like growing the economy and driving things forward. And another big thing is ensuring we have a kind of competitive innovation economy. We find from lots of our companies who are for, for perhaps thinking about, you know, building a new semiconductor fabrication plant or a new data center, that actually some of the incentives were really weak in the UK. You know, energy costs were high, the R&D tax credit wasn't keeping pace, and it was hard to get talent into the country. So what are those key levers we need to pull to make sure that companies can grow effectively? Uh, and after kind of collecting all those things together, we decided to look at, you know, what are the really big opportunities that we thought we could achieve if we do this? And these apply to a kind of a national level, but I guess everyone, wherever they live, will sort of recognise some of these things. You know, it's things like boosting people's pay by ensuring everyone uh, can access, you know, high paid, high skilled digital jobs. Uh, you know, ensuring our public services like the NHS are fit for the future by getting more digitization into how those operate and doing that a bit better than we are now. 
you know, reducing the cost of net zero, if we can digi digitize the grid, improve the way people can access energy at what time during the day, you can actually reduce the cost of getting to net zero as well as making it a bit easier for on everyone's energy bills. Boosting the British economy, you know, we find that if the tech sector was well supported by the mid 2020s, it could be adding around 200 billion pounds a year to the economy. That's up from about 150 billion pounds at the moment. And also we can help improve safety and trust in technology. You know, we know particularly from some companies that uh, people have sort of lost faith, they feel less secure online than they were before. And we put forward things like an online safety sandbox, trying to tackle fraud and talking about how the police could be use technology better, try and make the online world safer so more people feel like they can get involved in it. And that's sort of what we came to. So we're currently putting that uh, to government, waiting to hear what we've got back. We've had some very good engagement with the Labour Party so far, some good engagement with the Conservative Party, the Liberal Democrats, uh, but now we're taking it around also to speak to companies across the country and everyone who's interested. And I will leave it there. Thank you. I'm ahead of time as well. Um, that was fascinating. So I've got, I've got one initial question for you. So why, why is this a plan, not a strategy or a manifesto? Or... We thought plan was just simpler and easier. I think it, so the original working title was a kind of a manifesto, yeah. but actually if you're not a political geek, manifest doesn't mean a lot to you. And we wanted to make this as accessible as possible. So just saying that it's, you know, a plan. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's easy, and easy to understand and easy to kind of for everyone to share. It spans governments, whatever happens. Yes. They're coming however long. Um, so, in, I mean, you've, you've articulated sort of the five main challenges, which I think apply across the UK as well as in the Northeast. And obviously one, one of which is, is around skills. Uh, Kate, I don't know whether you want to come in because I know that's something that you're particularly passionate about being head people officer at, uh, at, at Opening House. Yeah, I think what, what's really interesting for me is that when we talk about the tech sector and then we talk about skills, people quite often leap to kind of what they think of as like the technical skills that mm -hmm. can be quite specific. So whether that's, you know, someone's ability to code or to test or to implement infrastructure. And I think you know, those skills are actually, they are really important, but something which is really true about them is that they change quite quickly. So in terms of like what the market needs, it, it actually changes quite quickly. So I think something that, you know, it would really benefit for everyone to have a more common language around is what we call essential skills, which are almost what sits between so basic skills are things like literacy and numeracy. They're really, really important. I think everyone agrees with that. We know technical skills are really important, but there's something in the middle which allows you to develop technical skills, which are essential skills. So that's really around things like you know, aiming high and having ambition and um, having really strong communication skills so that you can listen and learn, working in teams, collaborating, kind of leadership is an essential skill, which doesn't have to start when you become in charge, you know, something mm -hmm. which you can learn, you know, from a young age. And so actually something which I'm, you know, really passionate about is that we start across kind of companies and the education system that we have that common language of what those essential skills are, because we end up sometimes, I think, in sort of almost like arguments where companies are saying, well, we can't find the skills we need. And then the educators are saying, yeah, but we're training people in JavaScript. And you're like, yeah, but you're kind of missing the point because I need someone that can do that and these things. And so actually we all need to do more. So companies need to think a little bit more like educators mm -hmm. and then educators need to kind of listen to that that kind of nuanced point around let's help people to build the skills they need so they can keep learning and you know for an aging population like us as companies we need to ensure people keep learning so something that i read that was sort of quite scary said that people's essential skills are actually decline from their 40s now, i'm nearly 40 i really don't want my essential <laughs> skills to decline like and there's a lot of people with an open cast and you know in this room he I see no reason why their essential skills will decline, but we have to focus on that as something which we keep building. Um, and so I think that's probably what my kind of pitch is, let's, as a tech sector, let's kind of have a united narrative on that, which is, yes, technical skills are important, but actually if we focus a lot more on essential skills, the technical skills will come mm -hmm. and people who are able to keep learning and whether that's, you know, AI, whether that's kind of new programming languages, no code, look at all those things, you know, we'll be able to really adjust to those as, as the, the tech market changes, basically. Yeah. Lucky you being nearly 40. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, Henry, in terms of, you know, what, you know, that challenge in particular, what do you think we can do or should be doing from a northeast point of view? Is that something that we can address as a, as a region as opposed to waiting for national government to, uh, to insist upon us do, to making change? Yeah. Honestly, I think the 
what do you call it, the sine qua non, if you're going to use the posh uh, terminology of devolution, is that you get to be a bit more self-determining around some of these questions. What, what do you want to do as a region and how do you put powers, investment, resources behind it? So, I mean, that's a, it's a really thoughtful point, I suppose. I would say uh, the region, as in the entire Northeast now, from Durham up to the Scottish border, has a chance to work together and ask how do we want to mm -hmm. use what are, in effect, more powers, resources, devolved skills uh, to start to provide the scaffolding for that, mm -hmm. because th th that is what we should be doing. We should be developing industry-led programs that are flexible and that can make sure that um, we think about work and the region as an ecosystem rather yeah. than a set of silos that we push people into in a plan and provide kind of way. So that's one example of many that all uh, trend towards the same thing, really, which is, which is a having a bit of imagination about where the region's going, what kind of economy we think we're building and working back from that point. And, and not, and in effect, I mean, you can call that leapfrogging, but I don't know, it's just about being able to look 30 years hence with a deal that lasts that long and say, let's design our investments with that in mind, rather than yeah. this kind of incremental improvement on where we are at the moment. And that's a huge, huge deal for the region to be able to do that, I think. We're at a pinnacle point, aren't we? Because we have a devolved adult education budget. Um, we're collaborative. We're small enough as a region to be able to, yeah. you know, have what we call the two degrees of separation, which I always say is, is mostly good. <laughs> Sometimes we, we do know each other and we collaborate well, and it is very much going to be that private-public partnership. And I know, Neil, within the, re within the plan, you talk about, you know, that inter- you know, relationship between government, both national, local, regional, but also private sector as yeah. well. How important is that? I think so. It's a, it's a picture that applies both to the national level, but also the kind of various different devolved levels, which is we face really big challenges as a country. Mm -hmm. I think we've all got the potential to overcome them. But one of the things we're going to find is that we're trying to do more with less, and that requires much smarter collaboration. And there's some really excellent examples from around the country. So one which, which came out quite a lot was the Scottish Government's Technology Ecosystem Review, where they take a really laser-like focus on some of the barriers to helping develop and grow tech companies in Scotland, even down to the fact that um, train tickets between Glasgow and Edinburgh are very expensive, and that was actually cutting some people out of how to get across the country. And how can you target schemes to overcome those individual things? And that's stuff that national government just cannot do, yeah. but it's something that local and regional government absolutely can do. So we need to be giving people the resources and the space and the ability to partner with the private sector to overcome those barriers and then kind of achieve the outcomes that come from that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, just to make a kind of broad point about public-private collaboration and how important that is, I mean, completely fundamental in that we, we deal in the mayor's combined authority kind of odd government world in this strange currency of leveling up what we have done in the last three or four years and we don't quite know what it means i don't think anybody really does and it could be something really special and we can point to versions across different countries and contexts that we like whether it's in a city or a place or, and, but if we're waiting for the you know post-communist east german 20 billion a year lands to support regeneration version of that we're going to be waiting a long time so actually being able to use what is in effect um, a new investment fund for a region and some willingness from the public sector to start to invest long term as a lever for what you can do within the private sector and bring to bear that strength of collaboration i think that's where we need to be it would be a mistake to see this as being about public services public money and if you like um, delivering services this is about joint investments in the future of the region which goes way back to what, what you yeah. said at the outset i mean i think it's interesting i think it's kind of leaders within any kind of sector but you know here i guess we're talking about tech sector like leadership for me partly is around creating that clarity so yeah so may, we may have opinions about what is and isn't clear from anyone's manifesto or anyone's plan to be honest but then it's really i think about us coming together and saying well this is what our plan is like we hear what you said actually this is what we think we should do and you know like i think my experience of working with, with henry and others is that if you if you then really do put some effort into that, you can, you can access some funds, you can get projects off the ground. And that's really, I think, what we, we all need to do more of. We know wherever we are is think about, understand these kind of global and national trends, but then think about, practically speaking, like what can we be doing that like pushes us yeah. towards the future? And then obviously fill in a really good business case to make sure that the <laughs> public part is spent yeah. appropriately. Exactly. But we have to give some support for filling in those <laughs> yeah, business yeah. cases. The, yeah. But no, I think, it, I think it's, you know, I think, 
I think one of the opportunities for um, the Northeast in particular is I think there is, it's actually quite a lot of, I think, general buy-in to the idea that we want to be seen as a region that's very good at social mobility. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we know actually we have got um, higher levels of unemployment and, and poverty than some other parts of the country mm -hmm. have, but people I talk to all actually want to do something about that. So then I think there's that, if there has ever been a thought that someone else is going to do that for us, probably I'd question that anyway. Yeah. But I think, you know, when you think about, you know, a company like OpenCast, there's lots of things that we can do. There's also lots of things we can do if we collaborate, probably bigger things, because, you know, even though we are an organization of, you know, 400, 500 people across the sector, we've got, you know, tens of thousands of people. And so it's, I mean, it's really around figuring out, like, where can you best collaborate? How do you collaborate nationally with people like Tech UK? And then, you know, what role can you play in, in a plan? One of those things can definitely be to go and lobby and try and get, you know, government and public sector to do things differently. But sometimes we can also sort of build our own lifeboat out of things. And so I think that's, that's for me what's quite exciting um, and something which I hope OpenCast can help to kind of convene, you know, along with North of Tyne in, in this region. Yeah, and OpenCast has been a huge success story regionally. Um, and, you know, when I talk about us being sat here in Biker, which is one of the, the more deprived wards of, of Newcastle in particular, you know, and a huge employer, and I've watched, you know, this organisation grow over the past few years, you know, exponentially. And, you've, you know, you really work with the private sector, with the public sector closely, but you're creating real social impact in the area. And I think the more and more companies that we're speaking to, either new investors into a region or existing companies that are on a, a growth trajectory, they do, you know, they, we, we know that skills are so hard to get. Mm -hmm. And you're not just going to be able to ship these skills in from wherever, you know, the other hotspots are, either in the country or internationally, because everybody's fighting over them. But how do we make sure that we're reaching into communities and making sure, because you're right, we're, you know, in Newcastle in particular, we're tailored to cities. We have, you know, some of the highest levels of foreign direct investment and business growth. And yet we also have the highest level of child poverty in the country. So how do we make sure that those two mirror up? And Neil, I don't know whether you've got examples of elsewhere in the UK or, you know, any ideas of how companies can get more involved in that kind of social value piece. That we're seeing more of. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's very much kind of like what, what we've discussed so far is how do you get that kind of perfect lining up of good national support schemes that can deliver funding that people can access, but delivered locally and with additional kind of local knowledge to make it work properly. So a lot of the stuff that we've put forward um, in our plans, so particularly around skills, is, is, is fairly general, and we try not to be sort of too specific about what we're asking for. So it's things like just making sure the apprenticeship levy can be used more effectively by companies so they can fund the different things they want to use it for. Um, building a digital skills toolkit. So for example, the Department for Education piloted this really great scheme over COVID called the Skills Toolkit to help people kind of identify training opportunities and where they could go. We think given the amount of private provision out there around companies that have, you know, free courses, free badges, free upskilling. You could build a toolkit that you could use to help people find uh, the courses they need to retrain in a particular job. And that can be leveraged, you know, at a national level by a big company, or it can be used by local companies that like, well, we know a few local providers who are on the platform, we can use it a certain way. And then you can sort of deliver it in, in that way. I mean, Newcastle, I used to work, work in Newcastle a bit, you know, put cards on the table, I used to work for the MP for this area. So we used to knock doors in Biker and Jesmond mm -hmm. and around Newcastle University. So I know the kind of big differences that you get across the city. Mm -hmm. um, and there's no reason why Newcastle can't be like a phenomenal success story. It's got all the elements for that. Um, but it's great to kind of the devolution of powers crack along and more funding come in and it's going to be a, a kind of a hard slog. But it looks, I mean, I think I'm very optimistic. Yeah. And did you want to comment on Yeah, that? just to briefly add, I mean, I think there are, um, things you can do within the context of devolution that are um, about bringing businesses together that want to do exactly that. So we in the North of Tyne have a, 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 what do you call it? A commitment, a pledge, good word pledge, we call it. You find one in West Midlands, you find one in Greater Manchester, they're all called something slightly different, but they're all really about employers, often quite big employers. I mean, ours covers about 80,000 mm -hmm. staff because we've got some really big, especially public sector yeah. bodies in there. But, um, and we're asking people to commit to good workplace conditions, thinking about well-being and work, paying a decent wage. You know, these are all basic things, but actually through providing those jobs and routes in for people and being as diverse as you can mm -hmm. through recruitment, 
It's an incredibly powerful thing, and it's, it, it, it will impact in a way that's greater than anything we can do as the state for public services because it's so much so closer to, to people's lives. I mean, I think the, the, other, the other thing to add is, and this goes back to the big comparative advantage of the sector, if you like, and how that's impacted on public services, is that you know, we, used, we used to talk about uh, people who were um, forgotten or hard to reach. I mean, the idea that anyone's hard to reach digitally now is laughable, isn't it? I mean, certainly when we want to squeeze the load of taxes out of people, we know how to reach them or a parking ticket. or So, so, so using the skills and mm -hmm. aptitudes that we have in the sector to start to target things really around individuals, employment support, whether that's low level mental health support coming off the back of COVID to help people into work. I mean, they're all things that the tech sector as a whole mm -hmm. is absolutely fundamental in, in getting better at. And I think there's a there's a kind of collective responsibility to do that bit of it well as well. It's also giving people the, the role models to believe that a career mm -hmm. in tech is for them. Like, I mean, uh, Katie, you'll know this, like you can bring anyone from any background to tech if they've got the ability to buy themselves and think about, oh, I can be a success story. But very often people are screened out because they think computers are a bit difficult, aren't they? I don't really know how to use that. And it's overcoming those barriers. Now, there's nothing really that national government can, can do to really help with that or the tech UK in many ways, other than to shine spotlights on the great local success stories mm -hmm. of how people are doing that because you need people you can relate to. Yeah. And the most obvious examples of where it's been successful is people point to people who are like them, who are where they're from mm -hmm. and saying, I can do that. Yeah. I'll never forget you, Ubisoft used Stormzy as part of their gateway into, into some of those, you know, needed uh, education courses. But um, more recently, I was at Newcastle United Foundation um, and they were talking about how they've got a games room and it's, it's really, really cool. I mean, as a, as a 42 year old woman, I couldn't stay in there for longer than five minutes without feeling a little bit nauseous. But they open that up to kids who want to come in and play Fortnite against their, you know, with, with, with well, online, I think. <laughs> Obviously, I'm not a gamer. <laughs> um, and it was all doing about, well. doing really I'm doing well. really well, I'm digging a hole, aren't I? <laughs> um, but they, you know, it was to open up to those kids that don't have access to those games online so that they can go into school and have it, it doesn't disqualify them from having those conversations. And I thought it was a really, you know, lovely community-led project in which they were making that introduction to kids that usually wouldn't have those those sorts of um, access. I have to say, I took my kids football there on that football team there on Saturday. They went in the games room, then they went and did yeah, some football. Yeah, it's mental, isn't it? It's, it's absolutely good. great. You must go and visit. <laughs> it's really good. Yeah, yeah I, I think it is. I mean, it's super interesting for me how you kind of you can piece together really great collaborations through almost like these chains of like events that lead to people believing they can and actually like coming and working in the sector, you know, it's those kind of, you know, there's, there's organisations that are fantastic at schools outreach and figuring that out. And, and actually all we need to do as a company is give some time for those, mm -hmm. and those organisations to teach our people what to do to go and talk to, to kids. And, and same with Newcastle United Foundation, you know, they've got, they're engaging with people who maybe wouldn't consider roles in tech. So we don't have to go and do that full outreach. We just actually need to partner with them. Support, yeah, and support, support them. And I think so it's really around like sort of knowing where in that chain of events you yeah. sit. And, and I think if you're then okay, you need you know, you need people to be at a certain level of skill to be able to come and do the roles that you have and have a level of experience, that's great. But just reach down into the kind of the, the other parts and support those partners who are who are bringing those people you know, to you ultimately. And, and if we all do that, it can it can have this huge kind of sort of positive flywheel, um, which I think you know we are starting to see. That, that can happen and I think I guess one thing I find interesting is when when you think about you know what's the international opportunity for tech like what's our export opportunity we do have to be mindful that if we don't do this stuff like it makes the cost of doing yeah. this kind of business much higher and by that I mean you know if we've just got a sort of dwindling population of people that are very skilled like they're going to command really high salaries yeah. right for those skills and that actually makes us less able to export our services or be a location that someone's going to choose to build a game or to build something that's got a global footprint. And so, you know, it, it's all connected. And actually, you know, even if you're not that motivated by the kind of social change side of it, I think everyone needs to be motivated by the fact that that gives us, that helps us to be competitive. Yeah. And because ultimately, you know, people can build computer games anywhere. But if they're going to use people in the UK to do that, mm -hmm. we need to make sure that they're we're creating people at a good, you know, a good price essentially to Absolutely. do their job. And I suppose, Neil, in terms of sort of the UK picture, so if we're talking UK PLC, 
how do we make sure that we are obviously it's a globally competitive market on so many fronts on you know when we talk about tax credits and we talk about r d as well as skills and incentives and energy you know how do we really make sure that as a as a as a, a, a nation we're able to retain you know because we are currently you know top of the pile but how do we make sure that we're yeah, I mean, so we always identify a range of issues that um, we think the UK needs to challenges the UK needs to overcome to kind of get into that top tier of competitive position. It's worth saying that we are in a lot of areas in that position anyway, but there are other areas we need to kind of overcome. And the thing that when you speak to kind of a big global business who's looking at the area and thinking, right, should I invest? They usually think about three things, and mm -hmm. it's uh, can I get access to people to build and expand and grow the business? Do I have access to the markets to sell my stuff into? Um, and what's the kind of investment case? So, you know, what are the kind of input costs? You know, can I get a good tax credit? Is energy expensive? Will I get planning permission, et cetera? And it's, we've got to make sure all those things are really competitive so that when, you know, a big company is thinking, right, where do I want to place my AI research center, that they can look at somewhere like Newcastle and say, right, I can see they have a plan to upskill and grow the workforce over the next 10, 15 years. So my talent's ticked off. Oh, there's a few sites the local authority has identified and you can get fast track planning permission and access to an energy connection and then the national government's trying to bring energy costs over the long term okay that looks good as well oh and they fix the issues with the eu so i know i'm going to be able to sort of sell my uh, my products and services into into europe at the same time so those are the kind of things you need to set out you don't need to answer all the questions now but you want to be able to point to say to investors that well, we've got this long-term plan you can see over the long term that talent's going up the costs are coming down and you're going to be able to sell to Europe, to everywhere else, et cetera, mm -hmm. invest in us. And that's how you really put forward a very strong business case. Well, one of the things I always find interesting is that we we have got some amazing assets we sometimes maybe forget to talk about. Like we are actually, most UK cities are very multilingual. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's a fantastic asset. And you know, one of my sort of career experiences was working in Manchester and for a business that then scaled and it's now a huge part of booking.com and employs an awful lot of people. And, the reason that that you know the founder chose Manchester was primarily on the basis of like the international student community yeah. to fulfil like the customer service roles, but that had this great effect. It also then had, we had lots of developers and designers who also you know were from other places, so that diversity actually enabled that business to build a product that globally scaled. And you know you, we we had a massive in-house translation team, which in those early days that's what it was all about. Can we get another market online? Who can speak Polish? Who can speak mm -hmm. Spanish? Like how are we going to get those things online? And so I think that there is something interesting there for me and sort of some of the current like political rhetoric around um, immigration, which is you know, it's one of our real strong points as particularly our big cities, including Newcastle, is that you know, we've got a track record of really welcoming people from all over the world and them settling and bringing that diversity to bear. And I think that's something which some other countries, certainly you know, the US, for example, yeah. Yeah. doesn't tend to have such a diverse kind of set of, of languages spoken. So, that's me, you know, huge opportunity. And it's there for us to kind of really capitalize on that and make sure that we are focused on that, exporting that diversity and what that brings to bear. But if we had, and I, I'll have to say this, if we had Giselle Stewart in the room, she would say that was part of the reason why the consumer relationship centre for Ubisoft located in Newcastle, but there was a threshold for those uh, incoming workers who, which obviously Newcastle's salary levels, one of the attractive things about the city is that it was lower than London, but the threshold was set on London wages, which meant that automatically when the thresholds changed, Ubisoft then started having to pay above regional market rates, which was a really difficult situation. So I suppose, Neil, back to you, how do we lobby nationally for some of those nuances that exist within the Northeast so that we can make sure that our companies continue to be attractive and uh, and, and profitable. Yeah, I mean, so inflation has fixed a lot of that problem for us in the sense that salaries have risen and slightly overtaken the cap. The trick would be to make sure the government doesn't put them up again to then start closing off uh, talent and also signal that in the long term, this is where it's going to stick. So, I mean, things you might want to look at are things like regional shortage occupation lists yeah. or exemptions from the, uh, the immigration system. Um, I mean, governments tend to be pretty hostile to that. Um, so it might be you just want to hold the level down but you've got to make sure that the immigration policy works for everyone. Um, and that's going to be a, although I would, what I would say is sort of with my political hat on, both political parties in the run the election will be, yeah. um, put a, will, will, will try and encourage companies to spend more on training 
um, people that are already in the UK, and they'll both be quite hawkish on immigration. Mm -hmm. Now, after the election, that might change depending on who gets in and on what, mm -hmm. under what circumstances. But we've got to be prepared for that kind of rhetoric to come up. And then you've also got to be prepared to have potentially conversations behind the scenes with politicians to say, look, if you go ahead with this, this is going to be the real term impact. And let's pick this up again once we know the election has happened, or once the election has yeah. taken, ha taken place. And do you know, because we did feed at one point into the Tech City visa scheme, mm. will that still continue? I'm sorry, I'm a phenomenon. So there's a number of sort of discrete schemes for um, people who work in the tech sector, and they should all continue going yeah. forward. That's one of the, the one of the genuinely good things about the immigrant the visa system the UK has built. It has got those kind of high potential routes the, um, for various different uh, career pathways, and we should be trying to make sure as many of those stay in place as possible. Yeah. But to Kate's point earlier, those are very technical skills yeah, that exactly. don't yeah. really cover the board of you know the board. Yeah, and I think there's you know, there's an interesting question there. I mean, it's it's very much a sort of like ethical question as to you know what is better is it bringing people from other countries is it you know i don't i'm not sure anything's out and out better but i do think something which companies can do which definitely is our intention at Opencast, is you know, to start to ask and understand social mobility within your organization because i think it's actually in terms of like the types of diversity that we have tracked you know we've now been mandated for some time to track certain things about gender um you know quite a lot of HR legislation, make sure that you look at things like disabilities and kind of make adjustments. But I think it's actually quite eye-opening to start asking your employees, you know, what what's their background? And, and it's brought with people maybe don't, some people don't want to share or they do, but the more you understand about that and the more you can see whether or not you are actually being equitable about people's opportunities and you're providing, you know, the right conditions for people to succeed in interviews, depending on that. I think it's it's actually one of our diversity blind spots, mm -hmm. uh, as I think may, maybe as a sector, particularly professional services. And I think you know large organisations like KPMG are doing great stuff in this space. So I don't think everyone has to invent it, but I do think we we need to make sure that when we look at diversity, you know, DEI, and I, all of those sort of pillars, that we are looking at social mobility. And I think that's the thing that helps us to know whether we're really doing the right things by our local communities. Yeah. Because typically it's the it's more to do with kind of social mobility and those essential skills than it is to do with any particular ethnicity or kind of background. And so um, it's actually one of the harder things to measure, but worth trying to measure. Um, so, and that's yeah something that's within our gift to, to do. And Henry, is that something that the combined authority in its new form will, will look to try to, to help companies along the journey with? I mean, you talked about the Good Work Pledge, but there's sort of that wider piece, isn't there, around that kind of inclusive yeah, growth? I, I, absolutely. I mean, a it, it really interesting conversation so far, thinking a lot about contributions um, in, in a few ways, I would say. So, so broadly speaking, if you look at this new devolution deal, which is the document that sits underneath everything I've been waffling on about. It's not terrible, you can read it. It's only about 15 pages long. Uh, it gives a sense of what we're there for, and you'll see lots of language about um, economic growth and performance and productivity. But crucially, it is all inclusive growth. It sits alongside poverty reduction and that um, real push towards net zero emissions uh, in, in a way that's quite distinct. So if you look at uh, let's say, equivalent versions in different regions of the country, you'll see some of the same things in there in terms of powers and influencing and uh, investment, but you'll see a real focus up here on what you described, which is if you come up here and you're here and you want to be here, you're probably not here just to fill your boots and then go. You probably care about the part of the world you live in, the society you want to be, etc. So in terms of how we support that agenda, there'll be some areas that come through direct programmes, skills programs, good, good example of that. In some areas, we'll do that through thinking about the qualifications on our investment. So literally, um, mm -hmm. if you want public investment from this investment fund, there are certain things that need to be true. For example, the treasury need to understand that it stacks up economically, but also what's to stop us from having a really clear well-being framework around that, from really sweating social value uh, within not only supply chains, but direct investments that, that we make, for example. Um, and then as an organization, we will be an important part of a region that is growing. And so our own practices um, end up being really important there too. So the combination of all of those things, I think, are, are really, really important. And, you know, that none of this will happen overnight. I suppose the point of doing this really is to create a culture and a, um, a way of working 
in a region that, that so that companies organizations that are doing really good things that are really socially progressive as well as knocking out the park economically can have support to do that we'll have a champion we'll have a mayor and others who will say what about it how can we help and, and I think that's that's a really important part of what we're doing. And it, it, it is massively important that it doesn't stop at the river and that we've got yeah. the whole region acting in, in concert when we're doing that. Yeah. And a lot of work has already been done, hasn't it? So it's about not losing that momentum, taking us to May 24, when we'll have a new mayor and a, a newly established combined authority, isn't it? So yeah, sure that's right. It's sort of slightly stressing me out the volume of work that actually has to be done. But, but I just thought I'd play that. But thank, no, thanks very much. But no, that there are programs of work in train that are really important and good and things to build on. You know, the um, the work we're doing on talent together, great example of that. We've got work on sector growth, on infrastructure, and five G ish. I would say I was part of the West Midlands team that um, won the five G connected communities pilot and i'm not sure looking back that was actually what it needed to be so our own version of well how do we support the right kind of digital infrastructure in future i think is really important we're working with the national innovation center for data for example yeah. big program on digital inclusion so there's a whole bunch of stuff that's in the system there that in and of itself ain't going to change the world but that we can build on that provides really good building blocks and ultimately a lot of people in the room and on the call will be involved in some of that already so so we want to see a build an evolution really. yeah and i think i mean i'm a bit of a data geek but some of those things around like what we track what we measure like good work pledge is great we are we are good work pledged yeah. and you won an award recently did you um, you're, you're yeah. about seventy thousand of the eighty thousand. <laughs> <laughs> not, not, not quite not yet but i think you know i guess you know that community can get together and talk yeah. about you know maybe there are some sort of slightly stretching things we should be measuring as mm -hmm. a collective that you know make sure that that keep pushing you know it's great to be awarded a good work pledge isn't it but it's also important i think to always keep thinking what more can we can be doing so i think that's that's maybe something where some of that sort of social mobility tracking type stuff yeah. would be quite good to and share yeah. learning as well i mean yeah. it's all very well the public sector saying what we think is the good uh, employment uh, practices when in fact you know we all know that we're struggling to recruit ourselves actually you're the guys that are coming up with creative methods that will make healthy, attractive workplaces. So I think there's a lot of learnings that we can do both ways. And it was the award, I think, that you won last week, was it? Was it? Employer of the... Uh, I so, it's so PD Awards, wasn't it? I don't know. I mean, I think, I think it's like always that interesting thing of like different networks. You know, so there's a sort of a tech network, there's a regional network, yeah. and then there are things like, you know, CIPD, which is, you know, professional yeah. development network. And you, you learn different things from different places. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, at that CIPD Awards was really interesting, like um, one of the most innovative stories I heard as part of, you know, judging for that was to do with um, in the hospitality industry. Hospitality industry has had a massive problem with having people to do the jobs that they have, partly because throughout COVID a lot of people were furloughed and then went and got other jobs, right? Yeah. So, so often our sector, we were the beneficiaries of that, we were sort of bringing people into our sector. Yeah. Um, and, but like you say, like anything, there are ways to innovate in that space. And actually for them, it was to do with things like creating proper training programs into to become a chef, you know, mm -hmm. and, and reaching further into that kind of what maybe is typically being seen as what like colleges do that. And we, we just hire the people. And so I think there's, there's lots of learnings and lots of reasons why just staying in one of your networks, probably not right. But actually kind of inhabiting each of them kind yeah. of brings things across then the magic happens so, yeah brilliant we're going to open it out to questions so does anybody in the room firstly have any what questions they want to ask our panelists come on for one time only they're here yes hi hi marianne whitfield um um from msp a software company based with annie um, I'm just wondering, we're talking about all of these plans for um, digital inclusion and what have you. Have you got any examples that you can tell us about of best practice of things that are actually already having an impact and, and having an effect on digital inclusion? Yeah, I don't know if you want to. Well, Henry, do you want to? Um, just just a, a very local example that will have been relevant to Annick and other parts of Northumberland. So is, is a COVID example, so that the, the a, a quite substantial investment in kit and connectivity for people who needed to do online schooling and online work and couldn't afford to do it essentially through that two years of COVID and post-COVID. Um, so that's a really good kind of practical immediate example 
and over the medium term we, we're running two programs one with and through schools which we call school improvement but isn't anything to do with Ofsted and lessons and quality of teaching it's more about the wraparound and we're doing one on uh, child poverty prevention both of which have a really clear digital inclusion component to them just because of the reality of you know being in school being in life mm -hmm. getting a job connecting to the rest of the world and it being impossible to do that without a wi-fi connection a smartphone and a load of mates who are already in work so so that there's some really practical examples out there in the system the county council in northumberland's doing some really good stuff as well good team so i mean i'm sure you're on it already but it, it, it's well worth getting involved with some of that yeah in northumberland i know they've got something similar in, in newcastle called get online newcastle which is help it. it's training people who haven't been as literate on uh, obviously on web services, but to fill out application forms or to, to pay your bills and things that might come naturally to, to those of us that have been on for a long time, but also, you know, giving tablets and, uh, and sort of dongles out as well. That was, a, that was a big thing that came during the pandemic, actually, and then it's, it's kind of ramped up since then. And we've seen donations from local businesses as well to pass on uh, equipment, which I know we've seen across the country. Season. Hi, Susan Bell. It's probably a question for you, Neil. <laughs> um, there's been significant investment in the region in, lock, uh, in the digital ecosystem. What can we be doing differently? Because we do seem to languish, unfortunately, towards the bottom of league tables when it comes to digital. What, what is it we're missing? What is it we need to do differently? That's a, that's a big question. I think it's, it's, it's sort of the good work that's sort of being started with the kind of development, the devolution deal will be really important to kind of drive that forward. You can see um, in Scotland, for example, they've had a whole host of programs that they've been able to start up and run, which have helped attract inward investment into different cities because they've had that additional flexibility and they're not having to rely on kind of Whitehall kind of hurrying up and kind of delivering programs. Um, but there's a whole host of other things that you can do, whether it's boosting the kind of skill sets, et cetera. It's, it's sort of quite difficult to say what one thing you should do, uh, but certainly having a kind of plan and a longer term plan is very useful. Businesses often, when, as I was saying before, a big business will make a decision based on what's going on right now, but it'll be what you've got planned for and what the trajectory is in the future. So having the capability to set that will be really important. For example, I'm aware of a business who they were looking at different, this was a UK, it would be a national level thing but they were looking around at sort of where to place a cluster of data centers and they skipped straight over the UK just because there was no national data center strategy. And they picked another country because they're like, well, it was roughly level pegging, but actually they were able to tell us how they were going to create the space and, 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 and drive energy prices down for the incent over the long term. So it made the investment case a lot cleaner and easier. So kind of aligning things up and having those conversations and being very clear about why the area will benefit the business in the long term can be very helpful, but you need um, the kind of autonomy to do that yourself. Can, can, I, can I add a little mini bit at the end of that, which is to say, if you're going to look at this from space, we're a venture capital cold spot in the region. Yep. We are an R&D funding cold spot, both publicly and importantly, privately. Um, we are a scale up cold spot. So we've got a good startup culture, but the scale up bit is we're not there um, we have to resolve those things we can only resolve those things with i think a collective action and an investment case that's made together in the sector and that therefore needs a really strong devolution deal with the mayor and others in the region politically who are willing to champion the sector as a first order issue so i think that going back to what i was saying about devolution and its importance i think there's some really practical reasons why that crowding in effect that devolution brings, which you've seen in some other areas and so to some extent all the time, but not quite where we need it to be, and it has to happen pronto. Yeah. But it just is, because one thing to devolution itself doesn't fix all the problems, it's having that clarity plan. Like Northern Ireland, for example, should really be taking massive advantage of things like a cybersecurity industry and others, because they kind of continue and collapse of the assembly. Mm -hmm. They've not been able to set this, I'm from Northern Ireland as well, so I can just experience this sort of firsthand. Uh, they haven't been able to make the, the gain that they should mm -hmm. have. So it's having that kind of clarity of purpose and that longer term plan. 
some of these things also are just national problems, like scale, the scale-up problem is not a, a North East specific issue or a Newcastle specific issue. It's a, ch a challenge the whole UK faces. So that's going to require you to kind of look at an even higher level to address those problems. One observation I guess I have as someone who's like relatively new to the region is also that we should always look, we shouldn't be always self-referenced around solving these things from scratch because um, we are, what we should acknowledge is we are relatively small. Mm -hmm. So in some of these problems, which are general, like a lot of the solutions have been developed by really people that have really thought about this stuff mm. hard, whether that's, you know, we, we want to moan about Londoners, but there's an awful lot of good people who think about this stuff in London who've developed great toolkits. Like one of my favourites is this essential skills framework. We should not invent our own because it won't help us. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think that we need to make sure that we do recognise where we need to just leap, leapfrog by implementing more quickly the things that someone else invented mm -hmm. and then where do we actually need to invent something different um, and so I think that's something which you know maybe sometimes we are can be a bit isolated or we can talk to each other quite a lot and I, I think that thing about which networks are you inhabiting if you are primarily inhabiting northeast based networks I would say and you're in a leadership position I'd say stop it mm -hmm. you know make sure you spend enough time in a national network or international networks or um or at least you know, if you're spending time in a regional network across industries where you're likely to get some different ideas and some cross-pollination. And um, so I think, you know, there's lots of good signs of that shifting and changing. And I think, you know, Henry's a good example of, you know, someone who's spent a lot of time outside of the region, so is able to bring a lot of those connections into the combined authority. So I think that's probably one of my just perspectives is let's always also make sure we're not just talking to ourselves. And mobilising on those like key opportunities. So you talk about Northern Ireland, you've got a Game of Thrones. <laughs> we want a Game of Thrones. We're, we're growing our kind of screen and TV sector. Space is a very new space and defence is when. Yep. Uh, so I have to excuse the puns. It's you, you, you can't do it with space. Um, but those are new opportunities for North East that suddenly, you know, and at the, the Dynamo dinner, we heard about Leonardo, the big defence tech company that is creating R&D within the region. And it's, you know, it's, it's huge opportunities, but it's learning off, you know, we're speaking to Northern Ireland about TV and screen industry because we've, we've, not, mm. we've not invested in it over recent years, but we're on a bit of a trajectory up now. I've got Joe next. Yeah, um, my question's more for Neil, sorry, put it on the spot. Fair um, enough. But I thought a point you brought up earlier was really interesting. Something I've, um, I've experienced myself coming up the tech industry. Um, you spoke about breaking down those sort of barriers. Um, I feel a lot of the time, when I first came into the industry, I assumed tech was just around someone who fixed a computer. I've now learned in the job I do that it's a lot broader. Is there anything in the plan to sort of help break that stigmatization down and sort of reduce that pigeonhole? Which especially would be great in the northeast just to get more people actually into the tech industry yeah so i mean tech uk does sort of two things we've got our um we own a company called tech skills which basically partners with universities to apply kind of industry gold standards to courses to try and help people get into the industry and those are a wide range of skills it's not just coding or technical skills it's the kind of broader skills you need to work in the tech industry the other one is the kind of digital skills toolkit which we worked um to build up a proposal with deloitte and submit it to the government saying you could build this and it would it should cover everything from the sort of harder more technical skills that you perhaps need to kind of do the job in the end but also those more creative skills that allow you to um as you say you know the essential skills that allow you to kind of upskill where you need to but also to run teams to work collaboratively for us and we have long kind of been a champion of the fact that tech is not just for techies it's sort of it's for everyone if you can get the skill sets in the right place so it's a, a stigma we're kind of constantly challenging and we certainly wouldn't want to see any of the policies we put forward if we were lucky to, enough to see them adopted by the next government only focus in on those really technical roles. And I think we've got a question online as well. So I don't know, oh, Ellen, are you going to read that one out? Yeah, we've had a few, thank you. Um, so there's one that's actually sort of uh, relevant to this question that you've just asked, um, which is if people are aspiring to be in the field of data and technology, what is Opencast expecting from us? Okay. Opencast wise. So, then, yeah, very much depends on, yeah, what specific role are people targeting. But I think, you know, we've, we, what we have is a kind of open door policy, which is, you know, we really want to talk to people. So, if they, if they let us know what they're actually interested in, we will find somebody that will have like an informal conversation with them outside of any selection process, just to give them more information about, yeah, how, how we work, what we look for, and how our kind of interview processes actually happen. So, that's one of our kind of intentions around. That not feeling intimidating you know that, that initial chat is an initial chat it's not part of the selection process 
Um, but I think, you know, more broadly, what OpenCast um, does collaborates in the spaces around a project which actually North of Tyne funded called Talent Engine. So Tech Talent Engine is the, the website. And, um, and that's really a, a regional showcase of real people and their stories of how they got into the roles that they got into. And also, what are these different roles? So, you know, what's a business analyst? Doesn't sound particularly technical at all, right? Actually, it is. You know, what is a user researcher? What role do those play in technology teams? Um, as well as the kind of things maybe people talk about more commonly, like software developer. So that's a great asset, which, you know, again, we've collaborated with a lot of other companies in the region to create. So if, if you haven't, if you're interested in getting into the tech sector and you haven't found that yet, I definitely recommend having a look at that because especially if it's your first role, whilst OpenCast is obviously one of the best places to work in the region, we are not the only good place to work. And actually, we won't be the best place for every single person because it depends on, you know, on your, on your passion, your interests. So um, I think, yeah, the Tech Talent Engine is really a, a hub that has been created to try and really explain and demystify the roles which we've got and also share people's stories around how, they, how they've got those initial roles and where they've gone to since then. Cool. So hopefully that helps. We've got another one online. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, you've made it a priority to plug the digital skills gap, but what about the gender pay gap? Yeah, I mean, we've talk uh, consistently about the need to close the gender pay gap, but also include this greater ethnic minority representation across the tech sector. Um, you know, we've had a number of people uh, who've been real leaders in tech UK, our current president, as well as our previous one, have kind of always advocated for that. And they speak about it from a board level of being like, this makes your business run better. So it's not just a sort of nice to have, it's a competitive advantage if you close those gaps. Yeah, and I guess, I think for me, there, there is, there is more and more legislation that means you know, we now have to, um, above a certain size, you have to submit your data, gender pay gap data. Um, and so that does you know, shine a light on businesses that, that are or aren't, you know, aren't focusing on that. Um, I think it, when you look at how we value different skills and therefore where some of this gen sort of disparity in pay comes from, there's an awful lot of like his history to why we pay you know, certain jobs a lot more than, than others. But I think, again, one of the most compelling reasons for me around having a good nomenclature about skills is that those essential skills and the confidence and the growth mindset that anyone has allows them typically to earn more. And so I think one thing we should be doing, if not already, is thinking about what's equitable. So you may well choose to treat people differently by gender, particularly through things like selection process, if you're serious about closing those gaps because you may need to, for example, not look for female computer science graduates, of which there are still a lot fewer. <coughs> um, you may need to look for female candidates or you know, any gender candidates who have the potential and the essential skills that convince you that you can teach them the technical skills, which they may not already have. So I think it's, you know, it's, it's really around not you know, treating everyone the same. It's actually, if you want to close those gaps quicker, then you have to actually treat people equitably, which means more, more support for people that have maybe had barriers in the past that have kind of stopped them from getting into things. So I think you know, gender is a good example, but it's not the only example. Um, and you know, if you have a good DEI strategy, then as a company, you, you'll be on the right path with it. Did you want to uh, yeah, no, I mean, I agree with that completely, but just, just a reflection really on, on, on hiring and growing a public sector organization that's that's quite new which is un, quite an unusual thing most public sector organizations are well established they've been there for a long time as a way of working and i'd characterize it as a kind of halfway house between um kind of run fast and break things be a startup behave like a startup because almost by definition if you're doing stuff that already exists in the system already then what's the point and being a perfect bureaucrat that's spending public money brilliantly well as well at the same time both of those things are important so so when, when we're going through that process, as we will again over the next year or so, um, I will be looking for curiosity as much as anything else about what, what a different version of a combined authority or a council or a public sector body could look like. Almost a bit of a fox's nose because as a region, we need a bit of that, don't we? And so learning from how you've approached that um, in that scale up period, I think will be really important for us as well. Brilliant. Well, we're one minute too, so I don't think we should take any more questions because I realise we're standing between 
you and the free bar. It is a free bar, isn't it? Oh, actually, it's just free for women to recognise <laughs> gender pay gap, I think. So it just leaves say no, me no, to say a huge thank you to our panellists today and to all of you for joining us in real life and uh, online as well. So if you can join me in a round of applause, please. Thank you.